Hi. Uh, I'm Matt Blaze. I am a cryptographer, computer security type person, and a professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. I think it's. I'm. I'm Erica Portnoy. I am a technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a digital rights organization that is helping to keep your civil, li civil liberties with you when you go online. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Xavier Ash. Uh, here living in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia Tech, and uh, been hacking since the late 80s, been in the security industry since the 90s, uh, so here to uh, uh, here in a couple of, of uh, panels with EFF, uh, always a great crowd to be with, so thank you. Okay, so today we're talking about rainbow tables, if not you're in the wrong room. And the title of our talk is Rainbow Tables and the Need for Longer Passwords. So from that you might guess that yes, you do need longer passwords when rainbow tables exist. But today we're going to get a bit more into the details of what that means, some of the specifics of how rainbow tables work, and what sort of password related things you might want to do. Uh, so I figured to start off, Matt, would you mind telling us what a rainbow table is, how sure. it works, what are we talking about here? Sure, so as I mentioned, um, I'm a, my day job is I'm a professor, so I'm gonna drone on for the whole hour. Um, <laughs> and, um, but basically, um, to understand what's going on and why um, rainbow tables are a thing, um, you have to understand a little bit about how a computer that you log into with a password knows that it's your password. Um, and it's actually, when you think about it, kind of a, a tricky problem because you know, there's an obvious way to do it. One way would be there's a file somewhere on the computer with everyone's password in it. Uh, the problem with that is computers aren't very secure. They get broken into. Um, and one of the reasons that they get broken into is because people pick really terrible passwords that are easy to guess. Um, and so one of the first problems in storing people's passwords is figuring out a way to make them resist just having anybody who breaks into the computer be able to look at the file where the passwords are. And so this problem kind of got solved for the first time in the 1970s. And we've pretty much been using the exact solution that was invented in the 1970s since then. And it's to use a type of cryptographic function called a hash function. A hash function is basically just a um, type of cryptography that works easily in one direction, but not in the other direction. So you can take something, run it through a hash function, and you'll get a result out of that hash function, you can't easily take that result and go backwards and figure out what the original value that um, uh, was used to produce it was. Now why is that useful for storing someone's password? Well, they do this one clever thing, and as soon as you hear it, you think, oh, why didn't I think of it? That's a great idea. This completely solves the problem, um, except it doesn't. Um, uh, what you do is you take the password, and you run it through a hash function, and what you store is the result of running it through the hash function. You don't store the password itself. Now, when you log in, what does it do? Well, it takes the password you type in, runs it through the hash function, and compares that value with the value stored there. That way, if somebody um, uh, breaks into the computer and gets this password file, all they get is the output of the hash function. They can't easily go back and figure out what the original passwords were. And you could, you know, invent this idea as they did in, in the 1970s um, at uh, Bell Labs when the first Unix system um, was uh, produced. Uh, this was the password mechanism, and you know, you can kind of congratulate yourself and say, "Aha! Problem officially solved. Passwords are now secure." But here's the problem. Um, the first problem is that people are really terrible at coming up with good passwords. Um, what we tend to do is come up with passwords that are words rather than just random long strings. And worse, we come up with words that we can remember. And you know they're often kind of unimaginative because we're kind of unimaginative. And they do something even um, even worse, but more predictable, because we are humans. 
which is um, we tend to not um, come up with new passwords for every computer we use. We tend to reuse the past same uh, password on more than one computer. No one in this room is doing that, but uh, other people out there do this all the time. Um, so um, if you get a hold of one of these password files, the first thing you do if you want to figure out what the passwords are is, well, you can't reverse the hash function, but what you can do is guess common passwords and see if any of them hash to the values that are in the file. Um, and if you want to do this at kind of industrial scale, what you'll do is take a big dictionary, and maybe a big dictionary full of not just every word in the English language and other languages, um, but maybe pairs of words in all the, langu in all the languages you can think of, and run everything in all of these dictionaries through the hash function and just store that result. And then when you get a hold of somebody's stolen password file, you can just very easily look up which are the passwords that you can find. And for a variety of reasons, this technique of pre-computing all the words in the dictionary through a uh, password hash function and just storing that result, that result is called a rainbow table. And this is kind of the way people figure out uh, on an industrial scale what password you're using after they've compromised um, a computer. So the effect is that a password that you can think of and easily remember is very, very likely um, already been guessed uh, and is in one of these rainbow tables and is just waiting to be compromised. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about on this panel today is what do we do about this sad fact? Thank you for that explanation. Um, so we have the basic idea of why this is a hard problem. It's because people have pre-computed all of these things. So what is it that you can do to make a good password? Is there any way around this? Are we just all completely in the garbage right now because the, the attackers have this technique. What are some things we can do to make better passwords? So uh, passwords, like you said, that uh, because these rainbow tables exist, is that, um, and, and, and they basically uh, are, are taking, you know, they start with A and then B, C, and they go up and they do all one letter passwords, then two letter passwords, three letter passwords, and they create these <laughs> rainbow tables. And the rainbow tables, uh, as you can imagine, get bigger and bigger the longer the password. So uh, if I remember correctly, I, I meant to look it up before I have, is that um, you know, a seven character um, rainbow table, uh, you're, you're talking in the, the range of about 200, 300 gigabytes. Uh, a eight character um, uh, rainbow table, you're, you're getting close to about a terabyte, uh, a little bit over a terabyte in size. Um, and so that's eight characters. And so and you know that a lot of places say, you know, at least pick a six character password or seven. So that's why, uh, because it is uh, with the advance of uh, how fast computer chips are working, uh, especially things like video cards uh, are, uh, do this kind of analysis very quickly, uh, any of those short passwords uh, are very easy to, to guess uh, and, and easy to, to crack. So, uh, so the fix is, a, a much longer passwords. Now you could think of you know creating this like really complex. I uh, got five seven k question mark underscore and and come up with this really complex password. And if it's only seven characters or eight characters, uh, I can I can do that um, you know probably within minutes. And then but if 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 you've got a nine character ten character eleven character password. That's where it takes a lot longer to, to crack that hash. Now, um, so, so the easy fix is, is what I like to use, passphrase. So don't even, don't even just throw away the word password anymore and just use a passphrase. So if I, my passphrase is, is I like to eat chicken tonight. That You're is- You're not supposed to tell anyone. <laughs> oh, crap. Uh, not that password, but another one. Where, where you <laughs> <laughs> That password, even though it's just normal letters, it could be all lowercase, it could be all uppercase, you know, that is going to be a lot harder 
to, to crack using uh, rainbow tables than a normal password. So the here, uh, you know, we used to talk a lot about complexity. Uh, there, you, there still is a whole lot of people, and a lot of companies and a lot of that have complexity rules. And those complexity rules are really archaic. They're not really there uh, to help serve us much of, of a lot of level of protection. It's past, it's, 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 it's here, length matters. You Can you talk it. about the math of that a bit? Like, so sure. exa for example, if I add one more character, what does that change? So what it changes is uh, the amount of data that I've got to go through to find that. Go, to go from an eight character to a nine character password, then we're talking about several hundred terabytes worth of data that I've got to compare against. And now you're making it, you know, astronomically harder to get at, uh, you know, these, these password tables that use the simple, you know, hashing function. Uh, which, you know, we can also get, go down that route about how to fix that. How many he people here uh, actually d implement security so or software, web server that actually could help improve the way that we store passwords? I got one. Anybody else in there? All right, two. So, so maybe we'll go down that route and talk about, uh, you know, the, the right way to, to, to store passwords. But for the rest of the people, we're just talking about getting secure passwords uh, that. Uh, the, for each more character, after you know nine, ten, eleven characters, uh, you are you are you know it's it's a, um, a, a another uh, level of difficulty, and you're talking about you know uh, you go from being able to, to crack a password in minutes uh, to days uh, to you know uh, years, and so that's where um, you know a longer password will be secure in the long run. Yeah. So by the way, I should just say, you know, how many people here have? any kind of mathematical background, like you took math in college, right? So one of, the, one of the horrible curses of having a mathematical background is when you hear people say the word exponentially, you cringe, right? Um, you know, oh, this is just going to be exponentially better. What does that mean, right? Um, well, exponentially has a specific mathematical term. When you're talking about password length, this is one case where you can actually use the word exponentially, and it's actually what you mean. Um, anything you add to the length of a password is going to make the number of potential passwords you have to guess first exponentially harder. So if you add one bit to a password, it makes it twice as hard um, to uh, find as one that's one bit less than that. Um, and so the effect of that is that if you, you know, double the length of a password from what you were using before, you're making it way, way more than twice as hard to um, to, uh, uh, to search for it. So the advantage can be on the defender here uh, if, we use long enough, uh, if we use long enough passwords. Uh, the problem is that we start to get into the human factors side of it, which is that um, you know, we, we, could, you know, we could, as computer, computer people, just be sort of grumpy and say, ha, puny humans. Uh, they can't remember um, uh, long enough passwords. They don't deserve security. And you know, there are a lot of people out there with that kind of attitude. Uh, the problem is that, you know, no matter how much you badger people, they're not going to remember, you know, a 400 character password that's unique for every, um, uh, everything they log into. You know, I actually saw some cool studies about that. Uh, it essentially said that most people do remember one really hard to remember password and use that for the important things. They use that for their bank account, they use it for their other bank accounts, so when one bank account gets broken into, all of their bank accounts. But we're not talking about that right now. But people will have, like, you know, the, the sites that they don't care about quite as much will just use the same basic password. And that's not great because those are the sites that are most likely to get broken into. Um, so what you want to do is you want to have a system for not ever reusing the same even basic password. So that one really special password that you have, instead of using it for the important sites, you can use it for your password manager. Uh, who here uses password manager? Show of hands. Everybody. Nice. This is much higher than the general population, mm -hmm. let me tell you all that right now. So for the other half of the room, a password manager essentially means you don't have to remember your passwords. So what you want to do is let the password manager generate the rest of your passwords for any other site that you use that's not important. So the question becomes, how do you generate that password for your password manager? This one password that you want to be really secure, and that's where you want to get into this really long password that's as memorable as possible. 
Uh, there's a technique to do this called dice wear. Um, would either of you and like to explain it? You know, if you just go down to the end of the the other end of this hotel on this floor and stop by the unbelievably great EFF booth. Um, you will see um, uh, giant 20-sided uh, dice. And why are there giant 20-sided dice at the EFF booth? Um, and it uh, turns out one, one of the hard problems in generating a password is we are really terrible at coming up with random sort of uniformly distributed things. Um, so a uh, uh, one thing we might do to generate something that isn't going to be as easily guessed is rely on a random process to come up with words and components of your password. Um, one way to do that is with dice. And uh, our, our friends at EFF um, have this concept of diceware, where you take dice with words on it and just keep rolling it and get new words to add on to your password that you might have some chance of memorizing you know just for this one important thing um, and you can be pretty confident that it's actually going to be hard to guess because you didn't come up with it you just let the dice do it and these passwords are extra great because it's interesting when you try to calculate the difficulty of the password. Like you want to calculate the complexity of it, how many bits of security are in this password. And there's different calculations that you can use. So when you're doing a security analysis, you generally assume that the attacker knows the method you use to create the password. Um, but that's kind of the like worst or best case, depending if you're you or the attacker scenario. So for example, let's say I have a word list of 4,000 words and I roll the dice five times. That means I have a one in 4,000 chance for each particular word. So it's about 10 to the 18th total number of passwords that can be generated from five words on a list of 4,000. But that's only one type of analysis. Now you could say, well, maybe they don't know that I use this type of word list and I'm actu they're actually in practice just going to go letter by letter if they're trying to do a brute force attack. So that's like at the very worst, it's going to take them 10 to the 18th tries to guess this password or have to have 10 to the 18th entries in some sort of rainbow table. Um, but it might actually end up taking longer to crack in practice. Yeah. Yeah. Two to the 18th. 10 to the 18th, I put it into base 10. Uh, I promise you uh, I calculated okay. it. <laughs> it's not precisely 10 to yeah. the 18th. Get a whiteboard. <laughs> I'm happy to. Yeah. Do I need to pull out the calculator okay. on my phone? Like, we can do this. Oh, man, if there were a whiteboard yeah. here, you would all oh, be getting uh, logarithms uh, right oh, now, so you're that. welcome. <laughs> Uh, no, that actually ends up being, no, it's, uh, it's to the 66, because it's about yeah. 66 bits yeah. of security. Um, did, did you have one more thing to follow? Or I see we have a couple questions starting around now. I think uh, we can start going there. I saw it on the green shirt. Hang on. Oh. Hang on one second. It's too loud. Keep it turned down. A little bit more. Hello? There you go. Um, I was under the impression that there are two technological approaches that have pretty much solved the rainbow problem. One is salting, and the other is computationally intensive hash functions. Would you address those? Yeah, I mean, those are both great. This is a great example of what we call a security arms race. Um, because, so there's a technique called salting, and basically the idea of salting is that you modify the hash function for each individual password that's, that's, that's being used um, so that it makes it harder to pre-compute um, what, um, what you're doing. The other uh, technique that you mentioned um, to discourage um, the rainbow table technique is to use a really slow hash function, so they're making, making it a little more painful for the attacker to pre-compute it. The problem with both of these techniques is that they cause just as much pain for the good guy as for the bad guy. Um, so if you use a slow hash function, it means not only does the attacker who's trying to pre-compute it have to do something slower, it means the computer you're typing your password into has to do more work to verify your password each time. And so as computers get faster, um, the advantage shifts back to the attacker here. What we, and we kind of never win um, uh, on that analysis. So what we kind of need are techniques where the advantage to the defender 
doesn't depend on the natural way computers get faster each year. And uh, unfortunately, neither of those techniques achieve that very well. So rainbow tables are still with us. It also depends on your threat model a bit. So who are we talking about here? Are we talking about uh, a person trying to make some money that wants to hack into thousands and thousands of accounts? Then if they're not gonna bother trying to salt it for a particular type of account, because they wanna hash, uh, they wanna hack into as many different accounts as possible. And having to pre-compute it across every different service that might have a different salt for each particular user, that really slows them down. But what Matt was saying uh, refers to the specific case where you're trying to break into one specific person's account and in that case, you can pre-compute the hash table for that one person. Uh, so it really turns into an economy of scale question. And so it is definitely still worth it to salt your hashes, right. and, even and if it's not going to yeah, protect against but there every are, case. But you know, we, we don't get to pat ourselves on the back and say, problem officially solved. It's, it's, it's just not there. And, and do you know which of your you know, services that you use, what they do, right? For example, um, I think this might still be the case. Uh, was it Verizon that just had the, I think so Verizon Australia, there's this Twitter thing going on where they would actually, you know, um, they, they were doing some confirmation on somebody and they said, what are the first three characters of your password? So if, if the person you're talking to can see your password, even the first three letters, that means they're storing that password clear text. They're not even doing a hashing function because hashing functions, like you said, is a one-way hash. They should not know the actual letters of your password. So, you know, whether or not a company is doing salting, if they're doing it right, uh, um, if the, or if they're just, you know, whether or not they're using older hash functions that, that have collisions, that's, that's the problem we have, is that we use so many of these services, and, you know, they can say, yes, we definitely salt our hashes. Then they get hacked, and they say, oh, sorry, guys, we actually weren't. Um, and so that, that's, that, that's another situation that we're in. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. We're going to throw around the box. Sorry. Come in. Yep. Hi. Um, you talked about how archaic uh, some of our password policies used in the private sector are becoming. Are you familiar with the NIST ACE P800 series? Yes. Uh, NIST ACE, uh, let's see, I'm going to read it off so I don't mess it up. 863 has some new policies coming out from the federal government that they're trying to put into place and I'd like to talk about those for a second and then ask you a question if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, I'd really like to see these uh, brought on into the private sector but the federal government is working on making it standard to remove the periodic password change requirements uh, that we see a lot in the private sector or uh, in a lot of work uh, that we do every three months, every three weeks, or whatever's required by your employer. Just, we don't have to change it unless it's actually been stolen or compromised. Um, they're also getting rid, rid of the complexity requirements. They find that uh, a lot of people that are required to have complex passwords will just use the same complex password and increment it by one. So they'll have super complex one, super complex two, super complex three, and that doesn't actually increase security. We just have one very complex, long password, not complex, but long, uh, we can fix some of those things. And the last one that's really neat that they're doing is requiring screening of new passwords against known password databases that people use all the time, like password one, two, three. And if you're on that list, you're told to go and think of something better. And I'm great that y'all know about that, and I'd love to see that move to the private sector sometime. The question that I had was when we talk about rainbow tables and hash function and, and how they're fighting each other to uh, steal your password and protect your password, what we're really talking about is protecting identity and identity management. And I was wondering uh, how you felt about how much stronger, instead of just having a single uh, very complex, uh, very long password, I shouldn't use complex, very long password is to protect your accounts, um, proper multi-factor authentic authentication, which would you prefer? Some, some good and simple multi-factor authentication or a very long password? Um, well, uh, yeah, I don't want to go too far off the track on talking about multi-factor. Yeah, I was <laughs> kind of worried that it would be a little yeah, off but, track. But, so. Uh, so, so yes, multi-factor and, you know, and a long password is, is the route to go. Uh, however, multi-factor 
uh, that uses simple SMS is actually worse than having no multi-factor at all. Yes. Um, you know, there's a lot of services out there, um, Instagram being one of the, the, uh, the biggest one that hackers are using, uh, but there's an attack. It's really easy to just go down to T-Mobile or Verizon and say, hey, my name's Xavier Ash. I've got a new phone and I need a new SIM. And they give you a new SIM, they give, this, they give the attacker a new SIM with your phone number and all of a sudden your phone stops working and now they go and reset all of your passwords that use SMS as, uh, um, so, th so um, if you're gonna use that, there's all sorts of other uh, multi-factor, uh, Google Authenticator, uh, Google's got their new little, what's it called? Uh, yeah, UBKey. It's like 20 or 50 bucks they're, yep. they're bringing that's to the public. A, that's a physical key, yeah. um, but uh, Duo um, uh, security, but yeah. So, so uh, multi-factor's good, except if it's SMS. So I'm gonna beg to differ slightly and, and say, even unbelievably crappy multi-factor is better than um, than relying on passwords. Um, even even though there are some multi-factor schemes like SMS that are uh, you know that have known weaknesses, at least that forces the attacker to choose to target you. And the vast majority of compromises are wholesale rather than retail. They're not interested in your account. They're interested in harvesting as many as possible because there's a path to monetizing compromised accounts. I mean, you know, you know, and this is one of the kind of frustrating things. You think, maybe reasonably, well, I don't really have anything I care about protecting on my Instagram account. I don't think that that's any big deal. I don't really particularly care if somebody um, breaks into it. But you be effectively are causing ecological problems when you have weak passwords in the internet, you are the meth lab on the street bringing down the, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, bringing down the neighborhood um, when you have weak passwords, right? Because you, you know, abandoned this house and the, the meth lab has moved into it, uh, which is effectively what happens to these um, two easily compromised uh, accounts. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, we can do by rolling out two-factor authentication, even to services that people don't particularly might think are that important to them individually, you know, we're, we're kind of increasing the security of the internet as a whole. One more thing to add on to that is that password recovery versus second factor are two different things. You've got the authentication flow and you have the recovery flow. And you don't want your second factor, the SMS, to be the only thing you need to get back into the account. You want to have something else yeah. to be like maybe a second email that you have two factors on that yeah, other I'm email. Not um, not that. That's where you get into the major SMS problems where you could use SMS as the only factor you need to get back into your account. As a second factor and only as a second factor, it's a much stronger authenticator. Um, how does the stuff work if you, let's say like take a passphrase, translate it into another language, use that character set? Or, like for example, English has 26 letters, some number of punctuation marks. If you move into like Mandarin Chinese, that's some six, eight thousand characters. Japanese has multiple like syllable sets and Chinese characters. How you know does mixing or matching the character sets or languages so do anything? Yeah. So when you're talking about computer systems, really, uh, there's there's two uh, two things. It's either ASCII or Unicode. Right, and so if, if a uh, system supports Unicode passwords, then you can put in Unicode and, and that will, you know, then you can, on top of that's gonna be other character sets, but underneath it's, 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 it's just a two byte uh, instead of a one byte uh, uh, character. So, uh, so that's great if you've got a system that supports Unicode. A lot of times what they're gonna do is they're gonna downcode that to an ASCII equivalent and then hash that. Um, and so again, it comes back down to, but, but yeah, I mean, and in fact, if you, get, you can support Unicode, you can put in um, uh, uh, emojis as, as your password. Uh, that, that, that's also, uh, you know, completely you know, usable as well. But, you know, again, it, it ultimately boils down to what was the source of the randomness that generated the password. And if it's just what you happen to think of, right, then, then they're on the spot. It, no matter how you happen to be encoding it, it's probably not very good. There's a program called John the Ripper, um, which I'm seeing some nods around. It's essentially 
it is a list of commonly used passwords that it tries before trying other things. So if something is a word in any language, it's more likely to be on a pre-computed list uh, than it is if it's just not a word at all in the first place. Is it my turn? Your turn. Okay. Um, what I think I'm hearing in part is that if you increase the length of the passwords, you substantially uh, make them safer. Uh, and what I'm wondering is, is there a technique where you could do that rather quickly, especially if you have a fair number of short but fairly complex passwords? I'll give you an example of what I mean here. Let's say I decide I'll go out in the dealer's room, buy a book, go to page such and such, and find something. And in this case, it happens to be the word or words dragon con. If I put that uh, when I get home at the end of every password I have now, does that buy me any significant increased security? And also I'd ask a follow-up, uh, what if I also put it at the beginning and maybe I do something like put the numerals 2018 in the middle until I figure out something better? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, you know, we don't really know. Right. Uh, <laughs> anything you, anything that you think of, along those sorts of algorithmic lines, you know, maybe something that's pretty straightforward for other people to think of too, and then it ends up in the rainbow tables. Right. So you know, you've got to be pretty confident that what you're doing is really, really unique uh, before you. So and you could do all these clever things that you could do something like this. But for each of these techniques, the fact that you've told us that you're doing it, or the fact that something becomes a well-known technique, makes it so, oh, it was clever until people start doing it, and then you get into this arms race. It's better to just get out of this arms race, not from the computational perspective, but from the cleverness perspective, by using techniques that guarantee you have a certain amount of randomness in it. So if you use a true source of randomness and you use that to turn it into a passphrase, there are ways you can make that memorable, such as using diceware, but the randomness isn't part of the cleverness arms race. So it's better to step out of that. And we also think there's, there's when we've been talking about the, the rainbow tables here, the, the particular attack is, uh, you know, the attacker has, has captured a, a, a bunch of hashed passwords and, and they're going to you know, try to basically decode those passwords or they're doing you know, some type of brute force and trying to get in uh, you know, guessing your password. And, and uh, the majority of situations that you're gonna find in getting your, getting your account stolen is they're gonna reuse a password that you've used already somewhere else. Uh, so I, I pulled up this page here called Have I Been Pwned? Uh, if you're not a hacker, then you you know this might be a weird word, but uh, P W N E D pwned or uh, just a just a play on the word owned. But have I been pwned dot com, um, and you can uh, go to see of all these breaches that you've heard about Yahoo, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the others, LinkedIn, you know, so these huge uh, breaches where. You know, we talked about yes. You know, sometimes the passwords were salted, sometimes they weren't, and so sometimes the attackers just have this huge database of hashes, right? So that's a that's a rainbow table in itself. Those are you know millions and millions of actually used uh, passwords, and sometimes they're attached to emails. So now I can go to see if your Gmail, if you use the same uh, uh, password there, uh, you know, and and I can go and and do password stuffing. So uh, so not only is you know the randomness a, a factor, the length is the factor, but find a, a way to, you know, uh, using a password manager or some other method to have different passwords for different services. Anyone brave enough to put their email in here? Live? Oh, yeah. I've had this, this account since like 1994, so, uh, so where's, where's the list? Yeah, so. Um, so yeah, so there's uh, this one is which this the separate security breach, uh, the Adobe breach, anti-public, Bitly, Daily Motion, Disk, Dropbox, Edmodo, Exactus, Exploitin, Last.fm, LinkedIn. That's how many different passwords attackers have, and also security pros like me. By the way, we get these uh, the, these uh, uh, databases as well. 
And, and somebody mentioned it, but that, that you'll start to see it. Uh, where did I see it just the other day? I think it was on, um, um, shoot, what's, what's uh, a Git, GitHub. A GitHub uh, uh, just implemented this, but the, this, the, the people that put this together created a great uh, lookup and, and, and uh, did some great interesting math on behind on how to be able to search this really quickly. Uh, uh, but you, you can actually use this as a service if you're one of those people that raise their hands that they're responsible for a website, is that you can do you know, rainbow tables as a service or password, you know, crappy passwords as a service. What it does is it look, you, know, you take the password that you've stored for your user and you send against this, this uh, service and it'll say, does that password, is that password already been hacked? Because as long as, as well as looking at my email up here, I'll scroll all the way back up, um, I can actually click on this password button and I can put a password in here and it'll show me whether or not my password has been stolen. And so if it hadn't been before, this is one we should look for. At that point, so you're giving them your password. No, I have not. I have not. Okay. So this is one of my old, you know, like I said, the the, the non-secure, you know, where you just sign up for a website. This is a website, the web uh, password that I've used, you know, a number of times, and it's in it's in their database 33 times. What about biometrics, fingerprints, uh, retina scans, things like that? Is there, any, is there any security advantage to that? I mean, the four digits on my iPhone are not very secure. Fingerprint, I would like to think, is more secure. Yeah, so a lot of that depends on, biometrics really depend on whether or not the reader for the biometric is in a trusted environment, right? So if you've got a retinal scanner at the door to you know, some place and there's a guard standing next to the door to make sure that you know, you're not holding somebody's eye that you just plucked out in front of it, <laughs> or, uh, you know, or, or what have you, um, then you know, that can provide you know, a certain amount of assurance in that environment. The problem is, I as soon as the attacker can control the reader, they control all the inputs to the device, they control the output of the device. Um, so one of the things, you know, uh, iPhones have a fingerprint reader um, in them. Um, they've gone to a certain amount of trouble that, you know, succeeds to some extent, fails to another extent, to do liveness tests uh, in it to make sure that you really are putting a human finger um, attached to a live body um, on it. Um, if that fails, um, then it becomes really, really easy to spoof it, and the number of bits of entropy in that is too small to really give you much assurance. So biometrics are great if you can meet the assumptions behind them, but in a lot of environments, particularly remote login environments, you can't really meet those assumptions. Do you use gummy bears? There's an attack where you take a gummy bear, you use it to pick up a fingerprint, you put it on the scanner. So. Yeah, it, and, and a lot of those, yeah, the, the, the actual device itself, like you said, the, there's some of them that are, are very easy to, 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 to get through. Uh, some of them are, are just have a lot more better technology around them. Um, one tangent I'd like to take is because we're talking specifically about phones, and if you do, you know, uh, care about this situation, uh, uh, case law right now in the U.S. says that a um, we are not a panel of lawyers. This we're is not, not a panel of lawyers. lawyers. So, yeah, so, so we go read that over there. So therefore, you can take this as legal advice. <laughs> we're not lawyers. So, you exactly. Know, we don't care. Is is that uh, uh, that that situation is is that the um, police officers can compel you to use a fingerprint or hold the phone in front of your face to unlock your phone. Uh, however, they uh, need a court order to get a password or a passcode. So. Just take that with a grain of salt. Uh, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, but. We have another question? Yes. Hey, thanks for this panel. This is great, guys. Question about password managers. You guys brought up earlier, but we kind of skated over it. Three times I've run into the wall of deciding I'm going to get one, but then looked at it and go, I don't know a damn thing about this stuff. It could be one big data mining operation. So please, password managers. Um, probably better than not using a password manager at all is the first thing. Um, the second thing, I and other security people I know tend to use 1Password. I haven't yeah. personally audited it. Yeah, 1Password or LastPass. 1Password's one, one on, on the web, right? It's centralized? 
so you can do it in multiple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's two, a lot of the password uh, services like either 1Password or LastPass, so I've got LastPass here on my browser, you see that, is that um, they store those, those passwords in the cloud so that you can go from device to device and, and remember, you know, I can use my phone or use my laptop, and, and LastPass or 1Password can get that password and, and, and log in for me. So uh, that's really convenient. Uh, however, if you would like to step up, there's um, uh, KeePass, K-E-E-P-A-S-S, -E -S, uh, is um, basically stores it all in a file. So, for example, for the my work stuff, I don't want to store my work passwords in LastPass along with my you know, personal. So, just again, I'm a security guy, so I've got a higher level of, of, of paranoia. Uh, but so, KeePass is one that just stores it in a file. So again, different use cases for different scenarios, but uh, yeah, uh, for, for most consumer use, LastPass or 1Password will uh, both have been you know, audited, used by security pros, and, and uh, I would trust them. Yeah, and the other thing is to remember the game that you're playing. It's not to, the game you're playing is not to defend yourself completely against somebody who's targeting you specifically, because you know if somebody with enough resources is targeting you specifically, is going to break into your house and you know replace your phone with another phone and get you typing in the password. You can't defend against that. Nobody can defend against that. But that's not the threat for almost anybody. The threat is the wholesale attacks, right? Where um, you you are part of a data breach. And any of these techniques where you're using a unique password because uh, on every site because you are uh, using a password manager and maybe have two-factor uh, enabled, makes you, moves you from being a wholesale target into being a targeted target. And that's where you want to be. You want to force the attacker to be after your particular password rather than, you know, as many passwords as they can find. Um, real quick, first, I saw Erica kind of cringed when you mentioned KeePass. Was that the one that was sold to a questionable entity? That's the one that has terrible usability. Yeah. There's a lot of drama in the open source community about the different versions of KeePass that maybe that's what you're thinking of. Like there was this version and they branched. Yeah, one of them, one of them was sold. And maybe there's KeePass X, KeePass maybe. XC. Uh, I'm sure that, I think it was maybe open source, but then the original one was sold, but then the branched version of it is the one that like the like super free software people use. like. There is some version of KeePass out there for everyone. I cringed because I come from a background of usable security and I read all the papers about how usability gets affected and things and like KeePass is the one that's like so difficult to use that it makes it too hard to use it for most cases, which leads to password yeah. reuse. The Every most important feature is that people actually use it. Yeah. Um, so the actual question I was gonna ask, um, I don't know how much you, you guys as you know, cool hacker independent people have worked like in a corporate environment, but. Do you have any tips on how to get a corporate environment to change their culture around password policies, like the changing every 30 days? Is, you know, the is there any documentation we can the point them to? Or the NIST thing that, that he was talking about, which uh, is, is 863, be, if you all didn't yeah. hear that. Yeah, it's going to 863. Yeah, it's going to be um, standardized soon, blessed by the U.S. government. That is going to go a huge way toward um, convincing people that these antiquated policies are. There's um, research papers that you can point to, like the re these all the NIST standards come from research that independent researchers have done. So there's studies that show that the more often you have to change the password, the weaker it gets. So on the NIST 863, you know, it recommends that not changing the passwords for a certain set of days or whatnot. My background's forensics, incident response, and I think that's a horrible idea. <laughs> Most companies don't even know they're hacked for over 150 days. So if you're not changing your password, especially admin credentials, root credentials, for over nine days, I've been in places where they've been hacked for over nine days, they didn't know it. So, so they do call out that, that? that this does not for admin passwords, root passwords, I mean, so those those shared accounts, admin accounts, you know, move to using a privilege access manager is what they, they, they you know, they, they talk about, you know, you know, rotating those, having one use passwords for every time that you use those accounts and so, uh, it does go to into that detail for, for that situation. Uh, but if we look at what, you know, corporate people do, is they, they have, a, if, if it's, they, they put the month on the end of their password and they just increment it. Every, 
everybody does that, right? And so, uh, you know, and that's, that's again. And we're talking about salting for the people that, that you know, Active Directory doesn't salt their passwords. Okay, so we're back to norm using normal, uh, you know, multi terabyte uh, uh, hash tables, and I can I can crack through an entire Active Directory. So, in that situation, you know, again, you know that we're not uh, we're not we want to make it to where you can get good lengthy passwords that you can use in multiple places. But don't have to change it that often. So, so by taking away the every 30 day, every 90 day, you know, I can get I really like chicken tonight as my password, and and I can remember that, right? And to piggyback off that, do any Unix distributions by default sort their passwords that you know? Unix distributions, they all do. Yeah. All do. Yeah. yeah, I think by default. Yeah. Oh, this side of the room. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, thank you for doing this. This is awesome. Um, so in the enterprise space and specifically a lot of the marketing now around solutions you would look at for uh, strong authentication, they talk about uh, UEBA and building data sets around like how humans interface with the system to remove the password entirely, basically just trying to build a model of how you move the mouse and keystrokes and yada, yada, yada. From a security perspective, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, are, are you for that, or do you feel like maybe once that gets ported down into the consumer software space, that might actually be opening up gaps we should be concerned about? So I took a look at this. I worked for an insurance company last year that really pushed for this adaptive authentication. So that's a buzzword that people use, adaptive authentication. So uh, the one way you can think about adaptive authentication is if you've ever got a new computer and you go and try to log into your bank, it says, whoa, I don't know you. Uh, you're going to have to answer all these questions, right? So that's the adaptive authentication in, uh, you know, things are looking a little bit more risky, so I'm going to put in a couple more speed bombs. So banks have been doing this for a while. The other w direction on active, uh, uh, adaptive authentication is to find ways to allow people to get in with less friction and to enable people to, to you know, pull up their app and not have to, to type in their password all the time. And, and so I looked into this situation because they were pushing toward, you know, do it this other way. And, and uh, you know, I, I was fairly convinced with the studies, and you take a look at it, and each, each implementation is a little bit different. But in general, the amount of uh, uh, uniqueness in uh, especially mobile phone, uh, you know, uh, data that can be collected uh, is, is uh, it does make it where you can, you know, look at those use cases and, again, your own scenario, your own use case, and, and uh, uh, but that, you know, especially for consumer-based, uh, you know, uh, scenarios, uh, you, you're going to get uh, a lot more assurance that your end user is the actually person they are uh, by, by doing that type of uh, adaptive auth. So, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of caveats on this. Um, you know, one is that ultimately this adaptive user behavior, like how do they move their mouse, is a biometric. Biometrics have all of the limitations that we talked about, plus an additional <coughs> one, which is that it's really hard to change your biometrics. If, uh, you know, uh, once it gets, once that behavioral profile gets compromised, uh, it can be regenerated in other places, and there's nothing you can do about that short of like, well, I guess I'll just move the mouse with my right hand instead of my left hand from now on. Uh, so you get to change it once. So before I worked at EFF, taking off my EFF hat, I worked on a system that does these often, uh, these adaptive techniques, we didn't call it that back then. So putting on my EFF hat again, um, I want to say that it doesn't pair very nicely with anonymity. So if you're using Tor, for example, that completely messes this up because one of the major factors is what is your IP address? Are you coming from roughly the same location? And if you're trying to browse the internet anonymously, mm -hmm. that's going to change every time. So the people that most might need the protection of browsing the internet anonymously are the ones who are going to encounter that friction every single time. Like, the ones who see the cloud the Cloudflare captures every time they try to use any website. Okay. So you have to think about like who the users are in this case. We've got a uh, very briefly, I think we're remiss if we got a password panel and we haven't brought up the XKCD password. Oh, I had printed. Yeah. It's, it's nine three, there are nine printed copies of it on yeah. the X case, on the EFF <laughs> table. If you I walk around the corner, we will hand I don't, you I'm a not copy that good. <laughs> Good one. 
Um, but uh, we've talked a lot about changing your password. Uh, what about changing your email address for every website you log into? Um, Gmail, for example, lets you tack on extra characters to alias your passwords. Um, or if you want to get really fancy, you can get a domain and hand out a unique email address for every website you visit. Nobody salts and hashes email addresses. Uh, so the, 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 the one thing about passwords is that they're better protected. Like a what I'm saying in combination, in concert with changing your password, if I've got a different email address for every website I log into, um, a lot of people may reuse a username, for example, and use that over and over again, first name, last name, or first initial, last name, that sort of thing. Sure. It's just not going to help you against the password reuse problem, right? Because sure. once that password gets harvested, they'll try it against your other email addresses, too, just because they're trying anything else, everything. Yeah. Yeah, this like this search right here was just a password search, right? So they're gonna. This is now in the database of all passwords that, you know, it, it's in a word list, uh, and, and so it should no no longer ever be used. Good. So what do we do about the fact that most people are actually going to a place where input is a lot harder, right? People are going to phones, and input of passwords is actually harder. So picking long passwords is an even more difficult challenge. Like. I don't want to type in. I mean, know, you've probably seen words. some experiments around this. Um, if you use Slack, there's the magic link that people are doing now. Um, so this essentially assumes that you're already logged into your email address on this uh, machine, and so that when I'm trying to log into another service, it'll just have me open up a link in my browser, and that will log me in. And it'll just do inter-process communication to get me in there. Um, you might have also seen that Google sometimes sends you a notification saying, "Hey, do you want to log in on this device?" And it'll send you a notification on your other device saying, is it okay to log you in over there? Because you're logged in over here, so it has an online interaction there. Um, and so there's experiments around those. The yeah, problem with I, all I've, I've used these. Yeah, just, I exactly. wonder if they're actually any good. They're, they are all work for some cases, is the thing. Like, there's probably not going to be anything that replaces passwords entirely um, for every single use case. But we can try. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question about user IDs. Uh, does uh, having a hard one or a different one for every single website make much of a difference? No. So I mean, it's, a, it's the same answer as the email question. Yeah. Um, Essentially, like the passwords that people are trying, they're trying them against all the different accounts. Like they, okay. they don't have like necessarily a ma you could have a matching. It might be a little easier to have a matching of oh this particular email has this particular password. But once they get the list of all the passwords, they can try them against various different accounts across different sites. The, the one th the one thing that you know um, you could look at is instead of like a, a different account or a different email for every one of those. Is is to kind of you know separate things. Um, if you uh, you know most of us have jobs and and, and uh, personal lives, so there's two different email addresses. Uh, let's say you have um, you run your own business. Okay, the machine in which you do your accounting on, do not you know use for any of the personal stuff. You can also use that type of protection along with you know have a couple of different email addresses or logons. So if your you know main personal account gets into one of these bre you know, breaches, um, you know they are instantly going to go out and try, you know my email address at you know and if it's a Gmail account they'll try to log me on Gmail. They're going to try that, and so you can limit some of the you know protection by doing that a little bit. It's it's you really it, you don't want to get to a point where you know you've got five thousand different. You know, e usernames and passwords. Uh, you know, and, and so it's it's. Uh, I think that 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 might have some, you know, uh, function in, in in those scenarios. Use a password manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, I I did want to kind of talk about it for for those that do manage uh, and and create authentications as as part of their job. And, and uh, we talked a little bit about hashing and a little bit about uh, salting, uh, and, and kind of the, you know the right way of doing things. And you can you can look this stuff up online, and, and a couple of uh, websites go into it pretty well. 
Uh, but the idea right now is, is that uh, you, you want to make sure that you are you know, um, doing a salt for each individual user, that, that is, you're not using the same salt for all of your passwords, and, uh, and you store that, uh, that you know, password uh, salt along with that, that hash uh, in separate you know, locations in, in your uh, authentication systems so that you'll have a database of salts and a database of hashes, and it's, it's, it's harder, you know, the attacker might have to, to, to look in two places to get, to get both of those. Um, so just wanted to, if, if you want to talk afterwards, talk about, you know, more details on that, but that's, you know, the kind of best practice right now on, on using salts, and, and uh, I won't get into hashing algorithms. It's, you know, uh -huh. Sounds like he probably has a lot of, uh, you know, opinions about <laughs> which hashing algorithm to use at this point. Uh, can you be too paranoid? Uh, you know, if it, if it if it affects your 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 life, <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, with with password managers, it makes it a lot easier to to, to have different passwords for everyone and and uh, to you know have different email addresses for you. you. You can do that kind of stuff with the password manager, but then you've also put everything in your password manager, right? So if if that password if somebody gets into that password manager, then you know, so there's there's um, you know, the, the, you you've got to think about your threat model, all right? Are you uh, are you uh, a target for, you know, uh, North Korean spies, or d are you just a normal person uh, that has a credit card and is an American and uh, you know has a bank account and has uh, credit and has this stuff and and all of that is valuable, especially when you do it times a million. That's the most of us are just you know these guys are looking to to ma you know make the big money, and then some of them go after targeted people. But the most of the attackers are trying to, you know, pop these these sites and sell off all million, you know, username and passwords, and um, and, and and make make their money quickly uh, on on big things. And so, and then people buy those and then they reuse them. Uh, there was an, um, uh, only about two or three months ago, start email started going around where somebody bought. I think it was the LinkedIn. Uh, I think there was a number of them, but the, the LinkedIn was one of the big ones. And started emailing people and says. Your password is X. I put uh, malware on your machine, and I'm going to put porn and child uh, porn on your machine unless you send me Bitcoin. Oh, I got. I know what porn you've been watching. Yeah, you I know it. Yeah. Ones. Yeah. So, they, so they sent this out and said, and and of course, you know, and and I, I would say that this was a very high level person in my organization brought it, uh, brought it to me and said, oh my god. And so once I saw the email, like, I was like, all right, this is a form email. Like, I knew what was going on. I did some searching. I found on Reddit, you know, the, the, this was, it was, it was kicking back up. And it was before it was even reported on uh, some of the, the security sites. But uh, I said, I, is this still your password? Because <laughs> this, uh, this attack was like eight years ago. This was the LinkedIn attack. It was a long time ago. So if this is still your password, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, you know. Understand that that that's the, the the threat model that most of us have to deal with, and that's why we're here to talk about this. Is that in general, we're, you know, there are those cases. Yes, you can be super paranoid if you think that you need to be, uh, but think about the threats that you've got to deal with, and and uh, just act accordingly. Yeah, and the other thing is just don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. That's one way to be too paranoid, where you're looking for the perfect solution and don't, you know, if you're while you're looking for that perfect solution, use a password manager. Get two, fa two, two factor. Okay, and that is about all we have time for today. Thank you all so much for coming.